Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Councillor Stephen Holliday. I am the chair of the Etobicoke York Community Council. We have quorum. I'm now calling meeting number 11 to order. Welcome, everyone. Today's meeting is being held by video conference and in person at the Etobicoke Civic Center in the council chamber. This meeting is also being live streamed online at youtube.com slash Toronto City Council Live. Although we may be meeting in different locations today, Community Council would like to acknowledge that the land we are meeting on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. If you are registered to speak at today's meeting, please listen for me to call your name. I will call speakers in the order they appear in the list. The list of speakers can be viewed online by visiting the Etobicoke York Community Council page at toronto.ca slash council and clicking the speakers box for today's meeting. Members, the city clerk has provided all agenda materials on toronto.ca slash council and on CMP, the clerk's meeting portal. Clerk's IT staff are available to members if you need help with your devices. I also want to remind you to please submit and approve your motions by email. Staff are available at etcc at toronto.ca to help with motions. Are there any declarations of interest under the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act? If you do have an interest, please indicate the item number and the nature of the interest. Seeing none, we will proceed. Uh, may I have a motion to confirm the minutes from our meeting on January 19th, 2024? Councillor Nunziata moves. All in favor? Any opposed? That is carried. We can thank you very much. We can now go through the agenda items. Our first item is EY 11.1, Jane Finch Secondary Plan and Urban Design Guidelines Final Report. We'll hold that for presentation and speakers. EY 11.2564 to 580 Evans Avenue, Zoning Bylaw Amendment and Draft Plan of Subdivision Applications, Decision Report Approval. Uh, I will hold that for speakers. EY 11.331 Central Street, Application to Remove a Private Tree. We'll hold that for a speaker. EY 11.447 West Point Lane, Application to Remove a Private Tree. We will hold that for speakers. EY 11.5, Kingsway Crescent between Bannon Avenue and Government Road speed humps. We do not have speakers registered on that. I'll tell you what, we'll hold that for uh, just for a little while because um, that's Councillor Morley's uh, in her area. Yep. EY 11.6 is Public Lane south of Eglinton West, west of Scott Road speed bumps. Councillor Nunziata. Yes, I'll move the staff recommendation. Councillor Nunziata moves the staff recommendations on EY 11.6. All those in favor? Any opposed? That carries. EY 11.7, which is uh, Weston Road, pay and display parking. Councillor Nunziata. Uh, move the staff recommendation. Uh, Councillor Nunziata moves the staff recommendations on EY 11.7. All those in favor? Any opposed? That carries. EY 11.8 Longbourn Drive introduction of overnight on street parking, excuse me, permit parking area 11. Councillor Crisanti. Uh, thank you, Chair. I believe we have a uh, clerk's has a motion to defer this item to the uh, April meeting in view of some new information that arise. We're okay, good. Okay, so Councillor Crisanti is deferring the item. All those in favor? Any opposed? That carries. Thank you. EY 11.9. Morgan Avenue and Penhurst Avenue parking amendments. We'll hold that, um, Councillor Morley. EY 11.10, Tarragona Boulevard, Guns Road, East West Branch, and Guns Road, West Branch. Compulsory stop control, Councillor Nunziata. Move staff recommendation. Councillor Nunziata moves the staff recommendations on EY 11.10. All those in favor? Any opposed? That's carried. EY 11.11. .11 uh, changes to the Weston Village Business Improvement Area Board of Management. Councillor Nunziata. Moves the recommendation. Councillor Nunziata moves the recommendations. All those in favor? Any opposed? That carries. EY 11.12, uh, which is uh, my letter, temporary signage permit for the Etobicoke York and Toronto Rib Fest 
2024 community event. I guess I'll move those, all those in favor. Any opposed, that item carries. Uh, members, I'll just alert, there is one item that is uh, due to be added, but we'll give uh, Councillor Morley the opportunity to do so. Uh, thank you. Okay, so back up to the top. Um, So the first item is EY 11.1 Jane Finch Secondary Plan and Urban Design Guidelines Final Report. And we have a presentation from staff, Mr. Mitzi. Uh, over to you and to your team, and when you're ready, please begin. Sure, Mr. Chair. This uh, item was a joint effort by many units across the division, strategic initiatives, policy and analysis, community planning, and urban design primarily, and today, uh, Leah Birnbaum, Senior Planner and Strategic Initiatives Policy Analysis, will do a quick overview presentation of what's before us. Good morning. Uh, just getting this on screen. Okay. Uh, I'm happy to be here to uh, present on the Jane Finch Secondary Plan and Urban Design Guidelines. Uh, so why a Jane Finch secondary plan? Uh, there is growing development interest in the area with the arrival of the LRT, and adopting a secondary plan now allows us to shape appropriate kinds of growth and support the development of new housing, including affordable housing, and new jobs close to transit. Uh, the secondary plan is particularly well-timed. It's coming up for consideration just ahead of a major application to redevelop the Jane Finch Mall, with other large-scale applications expected soon. Uh, this plan is tied to a community development plan, which was uh, passed by the Economic and Community Development Committee uh, just last week. And a major goal of both plans is to mitigate displacement, which is a very strong community concern. So we have tied policies in this secondary plan to actions in the community development plan to support continuity for existing businesses and residents. Only the land use plan is before you today, uh, but the intention is that these companion plans would proceed together through the approval process and into implementation so that we can leverage benefits from new development that we know is coming to serve the economic and social goals of existing and future Jane Finch residents. Uh, a very quick word on community consultation because I know we have some community members here who have been involved throughout and who have helped uh, to build this plan. So we partnered with the Jane Finch Center beginning in 2021 and on the screen you will see an abbreviated list of all the community engagement events and processes that helped inform both plans including monthly meetings with the Community Advisory Committee and uh, five public open houses over several years. All right, I'm getting tips. Um, this is our district's plan. How's that, Michael? Thank you. Um, there are six districts highlighted here because those are the ones where growth is anticipated. Um, and our policies for each district aim to support the new development uh, of housing while protecting existing areas of economic activity, which include the very strong commercial core at the intersection of Jane and Finch, as well as a cluster of businesses, including a health sciences hub on the western edge uh, near the North Finch Oakdale LRT stop. So moving on to land use, we are recommending redesignating lands along the LRT route to mixed use, which is red on this map as that creates more opportunities for both housing and jobs close to transit. We have intentionally left uh, the employment lands, which are purple, out of the secondary plan area. Uh, to do that. We did that to shield them from conversion pressure, so they continue to be protected for employment-related uses only. Uh, the plan also retains the institutional designation, so that's blue, uh, on the hospital site to reflect the intention that those lands would form the core of a health sciences hub. Uh, the North Finch District, is red on this map just next to Highway 400, and that's the existing designation. There's no change proposed. The area currently has non-residential uses. It has several hotels, a medical building, and a police station. Um, both provincial and council direction require that we plan for minimum densities around LRT stops, and those need to be increased here to meet the planned targets. So residential uses, which are already permitted, continue to be permitted under this plan with policies designed to support the continuity of existing businesses. The plan also maintains uh, the apartment neighborhoods designation, so that's orange along much of, <coughs> along much of Jane Street, <coughs> because we determined that that gave us more leverage uh, to support infill for new housing, 
while also preserving existing rental housing and securing. <coughs> excuse me. <laughs> I'm all set. Thank you, Councillor. Okay. So apartment neighborhoods. Um, that allows us to uh, preserve existing rental housing and secure some improvements for existing residents through infill. So that was a deliberate not redesignation, but retaining that existing designation on Jane. Um, we are requiring the replacement of non-residential gross floor area and encouraging a net gain. And I'll also note that the Metrolink's maintenance and storage facility is located here and it's permitted under its existing land use designation. Um, I wanna briefly highlight the community development section of the plan, which encourages devel developers to engage in early conversations with the community and requires that they demonstrate uh, how their proposal responds to an anti-displacement strategy. You'll also see on your screen a list of identified priorities for community service facilities with access to childcare, community space, and community recreation space, topping that list. So this is a list of the attachments to the staff report that is before you. I include it here to demonstrate the breadth of this project over the last several years. At the moment, it is in fact a big pile of paper, uh, but we are eager to see this fire file sent on to city council and ultimately adopted so that we can use it to shape the development proposals that are accelerating in the area. So once the secondary plan is adopted, we'll move on to updating the zoning. Um, and continuing to work with the community through a community partnership circle that is being established. And we'll also work to align opportunities that will arise from new development uh, with the actions identified in the community development plan and with capital budgeting. And that's it, thank you. Thank you, we'll hold on for questions uh, and I think we'll go straight to speakers. So our first speaker is Christina Lay. Is Christina available? Is Christina online? Ah, okay, thank you. Welcome, Christina, uh, to the Etobicoke York Community Council. You have five minutes. You may begin when you're ready. Okay. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Good morning, Council and staff. My name is Christine. I'm a second generation Whitney Canadian and lived in the Juno Fence for 24 years. Um, okay. Hi everyone, my name is Christine. I'm a second generation Vietnamese Canadian and lived in the Jane and Finch for 24 years. Graduating with a bachelor's degree in political science and urban planning at the City of Tor University of Toronto and graduate certificate in public administration leadership at the Toronto Metropolitan University, I spent four years advocating for increased minority representation in politics and affordable housing. Currently, I'm involved in empowering youth and marginalized voices through the projects like the Jane and Finch Mall, the Jane and Finch Initiative, and the Community Hub and the Center of the Arts. Today, I'll discuss the Jane and Finch Community Development Plan, focusing on how mental health, crime, and the environment in connection to urban design. Crime is a significant concern affecting residents' safety and well-being. In section 4.4, Streets and Streetscapes, lacks significant strategies to address issues like insufficient lighting and surveillance, essential for enhancing safety. Prioritizing such measures is crucial to creating a safer environment. Mental health is fundamental, impacted by urban pressures and economic disparities. I would like to emphasize the importance of 4.2 parks and open spaces plays a vital role in preventing crime by encouraging social interactions and engaging in enhancing natural surveillance. These spaces must be priori prioritized in future development plans. Environmental stressors like noise pollution and lack of green spaces exacerbate mental health issues. While guidelines exist for natural heritage and water, conducting an annual community climate resilience assessment through climate change action can identify risk and improve emergency preparedness. Jane and Finch is a vibrant community celebrating diversity. Pri prioritizing mental health and providing equitable access to resources is crucial. By promoting inclusive urban design and sustainable social infrastructure, we can create a supportive environment. Let's work together to shape a brighter future for Jane and Finch, honoring its rich history and embracing tomorrow's potential. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. Are there any questions of the speaker? Seeing none, thank you for joining us. 
Our next speaker is David Maja, Magia. Hi, David. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, welcome to the Etobicoke York Community Council. Thank uh, you. You have five minutes, please begin. Okay. Hello, members of council and committee. My name is David Mejia Monaco. Um, to give a short background about myself, I've been working in real estate and urban planning for the past few years and completed my undergrad in urban planning at TMU. I worked in various roles in planning and development uh, as a consultant developer and early on interning at a, a municipality. I worked with a uh, nonprofit and private for-profit actors and I'm also part of the hub organizing committee for the development of the Jaden Finch Community Hub and Center for the Arts. And I also grew up in the Jaden Finch area. So I have a multitude of perspectives from different stakeholders and have a good idea of each of their interests. So now, now that you understand my background, I'd like to discuss the motion at hand. I'd like to start by commending the planning staff for including anti-displacement strategies and policies as a core theme of the secondary plan. The people who have contributed to the historically underserved area and population must have the ability and option to stay in the community they call home. Balancing the needs of newcomers and residents from other areas is a pattern that the community has had to deal with repeatedly. That being said, council and community has, and committee has an obligation to ensure that those who have contributed to the building and development of the community, those with strong ties to the neighborhood and those whom are integral part of the city get to benefit from the roots and culture that they have fostered. Maintaining and keeping the spirit of the neighborhood is essential, and to do that, the people of the area should want to stay and be able to stay after its redevelopment, if you want it to be a success. We must welcome new residents as much as possible across the city, and I think that with the secondary plan, um, the Jane and Finch neighborhood is uh, doing its part to create a welcoming community for many. A major concern that I have as a resident of the city and as a planning professional is the displacement of people living in marginalized areas of the city. We have seen failures in this regard, for example, with displacement of people during the Regent Park redevelopment and with Little Jamaica as a result of the Eglinton LRT. I hope that council and this committee take this issue seriously in all future decision making. When considering other planning related motions in the broader area and other parts of the city, I would ask that committee, council and planning staff continue to allow for housing to be built widely as the housing affordable affordability issue continues to worsen and um, not mostly target areas that have been disregarded for redevelopment. Uh, Low-rise neighborhoods need to take on some of this development, in my opinion, to take market pressure away from areas where residents cannot afford to move elsewhere or are being outbid by investors, newcomers, and higher income groups. I ask that the neighborhood area designation continue to be opened up for gentle mid to low-rise development so that the burden of finding land and space for new residents <clears throat> does not primarily and solely fall on communities that cannot afford housing instability and housing investment speculation. In my opinion, the PMTSA designations with the inclusionary zoning tools provided are core and integral to ensuring that the secondary plan is, is a success and al along with uh, other policy tools that incentivize purpose-built rental and affordable housing. If council values justice and equity, then they must continue to ensure that uh, long-time long residents remain a priority. In practice, inclusionary zoning realizes justice and equity as values that have to be upheld and included in the equation when working towards uh, solving housing affordability. Of course, there's a cost to this approach, but in my opinion, uh, it's one that needs to be inherited along with the benefits of redevelopment. By ensuring that long-time residents are not displaced nor disenfranchised by the redevelopment of this area and instead also benefit from their commitment to the community, the city council and staff along with the community would have made the initiative a great success. And this is what I'm hoping for. And it's what I suggest for uh, that to council. It's an objective imperative to achieve here and in other decisions. Uh, this approach along with densifying other parts of the city will improve the lives of many people, including marginalized and underserved populations. Thank you. Thank you, David. Are there any questions of the speaker? Oh, if you just hang on. 
Councillor Moore, uh, Deputy Mayor Morley, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for joining us today through the chair. I'm just wondering if you're familiar with the bylaw that the city does require for replacement of all rental units. If there are more than six units, there's sort of a robust policy that we do have in place. Um, I really appreciate your submission here today, and I just wanted to know um, how familiar you were with our rental replacement requirements. I am familiar, and I think it, it's definitely a good policy measure. Um, I think if there's any other opportunities to really incentivize um, in adding more rental stock, I think that should be pursued. Wonderful. Thank you thank so you much. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Yep. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Councillor Perutza. Please go ahead. Yeah, yeah David. Um, thanks. I, I never, I, I, I rarely ever hear anyone try to make an argument around um, land value and affordability. You said something that's that's kind of near and dear to me, right? As a, as a, you said that encouraging low to mid rise uh, uh, development, right? Yeah. Uh, generally, um, um, sort of maintains a more affordable. Um, how do you say? Uh, land value. I, I, maybe I'm adding the words land value to to your argument. I don't know, mm -hmm. uh, but but. Can I just hear your, your, your thoughts a little clearer on that? Right, I think that um, just adding housing uh, stock to the, the market will definitely help with affordability and finding areas in low rise neighborhoods um, for gentle density and increasing, the, increasing that stock will relieve some pressure off uh, these nodes of development um, where there's so much market pressure built up and demand and such limited uh, space for really adding a lot of units. And uh, most developers will probably target those areas for redevelopment, in my opinion, yeah. Okay, so, so really, so what you're saying is you're, it's, it's not about uh, more or less uh, and, and how that impacts land value. Uh, you're saying is sort of allowing a, um, uh, sort of a more gentle expansion of low-rise neighborhoods and allowing more st more stuff to be yes so, so you say middle typologies and others opportunities okay for All light right. density there. All right. All right. so I'd, I'd misunderstood thank you david yeah no sure. problem thank you any other questions no nope. um thank you for joining us thank david you. our next speaker is tori budhu It says Tori here. It's Troy, I guess. It's fine. <laughs> Sorry I about that, Troy. Away. No worries. Uh, welcome to the Etobicoke York Community Council. Thank uh, you. You have five minutes. Please begin when you're ready. Thank you. Perfect. So I want to focus today. There's a lot of things in the secondary plan that's important, but I don't think there's enough time for me to go through all pieces of it. But just to highlight the environmental stuff is really critical, especially with the indigenous engagement. Um, Retail, community spaces, this community development plan is all critical. But I think uh, I should position myself. My name is Troy. I am the co-chair and the senior project manager for the Community Hub and Center for the Arts. I um, was a community engagement, and I am a community engagement and community benefit consultant for the Jane Fitch Mall redevelopment. And I do a few things in the neighborhood. And throughout the last couple of years, I spend um, a significant amount of time engaging uh, with the neighborhood about development that's coming. So I think it's important here to unpack change uh, and the concerns residents have, um, particularly with density and heights. Uh, I think it's important to recognize that change is always uncomfortable, um, uh, especially for a community that has often felt that change is done to them and in spite of them instead of for them and with them. I think, um, but it's also important for us to recognize that change didn't come out of nowhere. Uh, the LRT has been a plan for a long time. In 2015, Metrolinx released a report that officially showed that um, housing pressures and land value pressures are gonna happen in certain areas in Jane Finch, and that was 2015. And while this plan is important, it does feel like it's a little bit too late with all the thoughts about development that are occurring. So when we unpack what we're hearing about heights specifically and development in the, in the neighborhood, there are a small, there are a portion of people uh, that are very concerned about heights and don't want it at all in our neighborhood. 
There are another portion of people who want heights in our space, and this is what we've heard. But there's a large portion of people in between. Well, there are the, the Yimbis and the Nimbis. I don't need to explain that too much here. But then there are a large portion of people in the middle who don't really know what to think about this, but are very concerned. And their concern comes from a few things. One, will development raise the cost of living? Two, will there be enough services to serve the new community and the existing community? Um, three, how would construction affect their lives? Will congestion cause problems? And then more importantly, will this still be Jane and Fitch? When we talk about the heights, I'll cover this a little bit. Um, there's a growing body of research that shows that development and heights in an area that has pressure for rent, or there's more demand, actually long term addresses affordability. Seems weird, but it's, it seems to be true. Um, the increasing price or pressure of demand in the neighborhood comes from the LRT, and the body of literature in urban economics shows that the value of land drives density, not density drives the value of land. But I'm not that space, so I'm just going to put that out there. For people who are concerned, we should be thinking about this thoroughly. Enough services, that concern shows a mistrust with the city and how planning happens, and this is just a history of the neighborhood. Um, but there are ways for us to address it, and the city is thinking that through. But the fact that residents are concerned about this is uh, a reflection of that. How would construction um, affect people's lives? This is, once again, a, 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 um, a reflection of how the LRT construction process has been, and people is concerned with construction throughout the process. Having a better version of this is important, and thinking that through. But I think the most important piece here is, will this still be Jane and Finch? I think it's important for people to think, why are people saying this? Um, I struggled this for a while. Uh, Jane Finch is a home to racialized, low-income folks. Uh, throughout its history, uh, dating back to the first settlers, indigenous groups, but if we start in more recent history, the Italian population, the Vietnamese population, the South Asians, the uh, Afro-Caribbeans, the black population, the Indo-Caribbeans, this was a place in the city of Toronto that was the only place in the, uh, in, in the city that felt comfortable for people. Everywhere else in the city pushed people out, and this was an enclave where people felt comfortable. When we look at these new structures coming into a place, they are great. Um, let me just go back a bit. Uh, I think people who call um, Jane and Finch home and proud of it are not proud of the physical structures in it. They're proud of the social structures, They're proud of the well-being and um, and comfort people have with their neighbors, the sense of belonging. I think when you look at these new structures, it's hard for people to look at these new structures from outside of our neighborhood, that's our, in Toronto in general, other places, and when you bring that into our neighborhood, there is a concern that you're bringing that exclusion into the neighborhood as well, and that people won't feel included into their own spaces. Troy, can I just get you to wrap up because we're over time? Yes, Thank and you. this is why I think it's important to emphasize the growing in place piece and the anti-displacement piece. Uh, it's important to also recognize that a lot of this work comes from residents in the neighborhood who knew these things were occurring and worked with the city to make sure an anti-displacement process is in place. And we should also think through delaying a process that's already happening. There's developers already at the door ready to do this work. What would that be for the real concern that people have in the neighborhood is losing the one space in Toronto that they feel welcome. Thank you, Troy. Are there any questions of the speaker? Seeing none, thank you for joining us today. Oh, I'm... Apologies, I didn't see. Deputy Mayor Morley. Thanks, Vince. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, through you. Uh, thank you for joining us here today, Troy, and for the work that you do in the neighborhood. Um, you spoke to some of the social um, uh, pieces that are really critical for area residents. And as we consider the plan before us, do you have any specific suggestions or recommendations on what can happen at the community level to support the ongoing um, resilience of those social structure pieces while we work through uh, redevelopment of the community? I think there is a need, strong partnerships with the local neighborhood. Um, I think there is making information more accessible. I think there is a, a ton of concern out of a historical mistrust of working with the city. Um, I think it's important for us to build on these things. The, what causes displacement is huge. Um, understanding the consequences of, of um, 
development is huge and there's a lot of people who just don't understand what's occurring and they're they're scared uh to lose their place and i think it's also really important to listen to to the residents who are speaking about these things uh they're concerned that the city is not going to be for them and it does feel growing up in this space and working in this in, in this uh this type of work uh, and being from the neighborhood and being from our background that the city is actively fighting us to not be here so what are we actively doing to make sure that occurs? And this, the, the anti-displacement piece is one part to get developers to think about it, but also a bigger part for us to work together to figure out how we could keep this space as diverse as it is now. Thanks so much. I'm sure you're going to continue to be part of that work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Uh, um, Councillor Crisanti. Um, thank you, Chair. So um, earlier when, when staff made the presentation, they made it very clear they're going to Excuse me, can you? Oh, no, uh, no. Uh, <laughs> Troy. <laughs> Stay with me for a sec. No worries. <laughs> so earlier when, when staff uh, made their presentation, they, they mentioned that they're going to have a number of, of uh, 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 further community consultations. I believe they said something like 30. That number rings a bell. Yeah, okay, so 30. And I know you, got, you, have, you happen to have a great counselor, so I'm sure he's going to do something too. Um, so I, I just wanted to circle back to, I think, a point you made about uh, concerned about did you say concerned about heights is that what you said there's concerns about development in general but heights are one of those things um, what about the heights uh, so there are certain areas in the neighborhood that have higher heights um, or just towers in general that are bigger than towers in in, in the current existing space mm -hmm. and there is uh, a shock to that piece okay. and then that gets break down into different pieces there's people who just don't want it at all but then there's people who are concerned that this will cause rents to go up this will cause a whole host of things and then most importantly of that is this won't be our neighborhood to begin with and there are like if you go through the research of these things the the, the affordability piece it doesn't seem like that is true yeah. it seems like there's there's evidence showing that it actually releases pressure and that pressure is coming from the demand for the LRT. But then the, all these other pieces, there are ways for you to work with development to make sure it feels like a neighborhood. And I did work with the Jane Finch Malls, but, I, but that's like the way we engaged uh, specifically around how to make this place feel like a neighborhood that people will be comfortable with and watching people go from a place of, I'm not sure about this, but then I'm really comfortable in this space. That's type of process that we need developers to think through because there are planners and other people who are thinking about this, but unless you actually force the development world to think this through or give them an incentive or a way to push it, that's how it goes. And I'm like, just on the other end of this, I'm doing my master's in real estate and infrastructure and we are talking to a bunch of developers and just like trying to think through or trying to push them to think this way isn't easy because it's not new. It's a change within that industry. So having a city push that is... All right, thank you. No, just quickly, because I'm, I'm going to run out of time. So uh, are, you, are you comfortable that Jane Finch area has adequate community space right now? Uh, you know, sadly, given the, the what, what's happening in terms of crime, we want to make sure we develop a community that's going to make it a safer, more inclusive community for everyone. So what's your opinion on, on uh, the community space? Do we need more? Um, any, any thoughts on that? Um, that's an easy question for me. Of course, we need more space, and this is why we're working on the hub. Uh, community space is super important and making sure that it, it addresses needs, but also looking at our existing community spaces and figuring out why it's either checking out how it's being utilized and how we can improve that, that, that type of work. There is a lot of uh, good effort throughout the history of trying to make these things work, but I think they're learning from that and making it more open and communal is uh, important. And thinking through some of the long-term plans with the Toronto Land Corporation and utilizing school spaces and other pieces would be super useful. All right, thanks so much. No problem, thank Appreciate you. It. Thank you, Councillor. Are there any other questions of the speaker? Nope, thank you. Our next speaker is uh, Amar Singh. Amar's on, online, okay, thank you. Good morning, Amar. It's Stephen Holliday, Chair of the Typical York Community Council. Can you hear me? Hi, good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, welcome. Um, we can hear you very well. 
Um, you have five minutes to speak to the committee. Please begin. Great, thank you. My name is Amr Singh and I'm a land use planner at Toronto Lands Corporation. TLC is a wholly owned subsidiary of the Toronto District School Board responsible for all land use planning and real estate matters on their behalf. The TDSB owns and operates 11 elementary schools and one secondary school within the Jane Finch Community Services and Facility Study Area. TLC and TDSB worked with city staff to prepare the Jane Finch DSF strategy, reporting on the status of local school accommodation and their capacity to accommodate future growth. Two elementary schools in one secondary school are located within the Jane Finch draft secondary plan area. I'm here to express our concerns with two policies in this plan regarding wind and shadow on parks, which is policy 6.2.3, and the low-rise neighborhood district policy 4.1i. Policy 6.2.3 D and E speak to locating and designing new development to ensure wind and shadow impacts are mitigated on parks. It is important that schoolyards are explicitly included, included along with parks, as precluding them from this policy could result in situations where schoolyards are notably impacted by wind and shadow from neighboring developments, despite their function as community green spaces. We're particularly concerned because there have been previous OLT cases where shadowing on schoolyards was rationalized because the policy only mentioned parks and did not explicitly mention schoolyards as a land use type where such impact should be minimized. Policy 4.1i provides land use direction in the low rise neighborhood district permitting gentle intensification. The TDSB anticipates the need to increase the capacity of this of of its existing schools in the area, which would likely involve additions to and or rebuilding some of its schools. Therefore, TLC is simply requesting that this policy reflect that growth be supported by community services and facilities, similar to the policies in the other districts in section 4.1. We also want to protect against a scenario in future years where the absence of reference to CSNFs in this policy is interpreted to suggest that additional school capacity should not go on existing TDSB sites in this district. If Community Council makes a decision to adopt the Jane Finch Secondary Plan, TLC requests that these minor text additions be included into the mentioned policy. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Omar. Are there any questions? Seeing none, thank you for joining us today. Uh, our next speaker is Anna Kay Brown. Anna Kay is online. Anna Kay, it's Stephen Holliday, Chair of the Etobicoke York Community Council. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I hope you guys can also hear me. Very well. Okay. Thank you so, and welcome. You've got okay. five minutes. Please begin when you're ready. Okay, so my name is Anna K. Brown, and I'm a resident of the Jane and Finch community, and I also work for the Jane and Finch Family Center. Um, I'm also a part of the Housing Coalition. I'm part of the Jane and Finch Education Action Group and many other things that I participate in my lovely community of Jane and Finch. I am here because I want to ensure that the plans, um, the secondary plan that is for Jane and Finch, that, um, and I know a few of my other um, colleagues and community members have also said it already, but I really wanna emphasize um, around um, housing, affordable housing, that this is a big part of the discussion and not just about it just being implemented, but also the process of in which we, we look at um, affordable housing, the different type of housing styles from co op housing to not um, rental units to affordable. So there's many different options that people are interested in. Jane and Finch is a unique community. And um, I'm gonna really today be speaking from the heart about this community that I've been, the pleasure of being a part of for the last 15 and a half years. And um, just like somebody who work and live here, many of the issues, that we see happens and talk about in Jane and Finch affects each and every one of us that lives here. Um, and housing is a big part and community space infrastructures, up, um, upgrades and new infrastructures that are needed for our community is also some of the biggest things. But most of all with changes that comes in a community, our biggest thing is around displacement. And usually, and not just usually, 90% of the time, I want to say, in my opinion, those who are affected by displacement are the current residents, our marginalized community. And as we're seeing redevelopment in many other um, 
places like Regent Park, um, Lawrence Heights, so many other of those other communities that are heavily racialized. Oftentimes, those are not the residents who are able to occupy those new spaces and enjoy those new amenities and those um, new community um, amenities. So um, with that too, we look at what economic opportunities comes in when there is redevelopments um, in our community. Right now I'm working on a project called the Black Creek Fair Economy Project, which is how we leverage opportunities, economic opportunities that are happening in the community. So from our MSF site, how do we create, um, there is jobs for local residents that they can tap into so that community can continue to afford to live in this space. So um, some of the other things that we talk about also is around when I'm gonna go back to affordable housing and I know I'm a little bit all over the place, but I wanted to just touch on a little bit of everything. Where we talk about affordable, it needs to be equitable. Um, you know, Jane and Finch, uh, our community also have the Fur Girl Revitalization Project. How do we ensure that um, not only are we replacing just the um, the the RGI units that that are that have been destroyed, but how do we increase more and also other rental opportunities for local residents? Um, also about the inclusionary zoning. How do we um, how to implement that at the provincial level. Um, when we talk about um, the type of housings that are also being built, I know people talked about heights and so forth so far, but also one of the biggest thing is they need to be family oriented. Jane and Finch, one thing about this community, it is family oriented, meaning that there is also um, intergenerational families that are living together. So grandparents, aunts and uncles and family that are collectively cohabitating and um, those spaces also need to be reflective of our community. So a lot of some of the plans that we're also seeing for a majorly, like one, a sprinkle of two bedrooms and the three bedrooms, I call them are the unicorns because they're basically non-existent. Um, and I think that those planning are very un, uh, intentional about who they're planning for for the community. And we need to also think about the residents that are here, that are currently here and that they also have the right to be in these spaces and enjoy these spaces and continue to afford to live in these spaces. And I just know that I have a few seconds. And once again, I think this is where it really goes back to the city has to be very conscious about um, displacement and working with residents and resident leads to ensure that um, mechanism and agreement policies are all in place to ensure that as we can minimize, I'm never gonna think that we're gonna get rid of displacement, but minimize the effect on current residents. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, are there any questions of the speaker? Seeing none. Uh, Anna Kay, thank you for joining us today. Um, and that concludes, thank you. Our, that concludes our list of speakers. So uh, I'm advised that uh, uh, Councillor Peruzza has a procedural motion. So before we go into questions, I'm going to turn it over to Councillor Peruzza. We're going to move that motion, I think. Uh, happy to do that, Mr. Chair. And it just basically, uh, um, perhaps staff can put it on a thing. I just ask the, that uh, we adjourn the meeting and uh, basically uh, refer this uh, study back to staff for a sober second look in, in two areas. One, uh, I think some of the speakers spoke to this, Troy specifically uh, uh, spoke to this, is this plan envisions an urban design form that is very, very different than what this neighborhood is accustomed to. We're, we're moving to a very high, high, high rise urban format that is um, while in some areas um, might be more appropriate around the, the corners and around the LRT, but I think as you w move away from the LRT and you move uh, further south and further north, and that's not to say that, that we need to uh, lower the density levels or any of those things, no. It, it really, it's about urban form, right? Going from, uh, you know, a mid-rise, uh, urban form currently to a much different uh, uh, um, 
uh, you know, sort of um, cityscape than than what the what the neighborhood is used to, uh, and that uh, obviously uh, as well as you know, it's connected to uh, to land values and all those other things that some of the other folks in 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 the in the community uh, some of the the trepidations that they have. The second thing that I would like our planning staff to have a, a sober second look at is the cluster around the 400 and the two off-ramps. So the 400 uh, on the, both the east and west side, as, you, as it moves north and south, uh, uh, north of Shepherd, and actually continues on well north of Steeles, but uh, our, the city are limit ends at Steeles is bounded by um, employment, uh, employment areas on either side, okay? And those employment areas, uh, you know, it, we've, we've nurtured them uh, tried to try to make them successful. It's the places where people work in the, in the neighborhood, right, in, uh, in that area. Uh, and uh, we, we had a, a hospital there uh, right off the, the, the ramp of the 400 on Finch Avenue on the south side, uh, York Finch Hospital. York Finch Hospital, uh, back in the day when North York Council was actively sort of looking at uh, the hospital and the cluster, uh, was actively encouraging a medical cluster of sorts because people were in the neighborhood, uh, continued to clamor for jobs and services, um, specifically health uh, care type services. And that cluster began to take root in that area. Uh, there's uh, several uh, medical office buildings that that sort of sprang up uh, in 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 and around the hospital. So the hospital continues to be there. Uh, they uh, they um, they had envisioned closing it and and I guess uh, doing something else with it. But uh, in their in their wisdom, they they stayed. Uh, those clusters are are still very active. I believe that that we uh, you know have an opportunity here to continue to uh, encourage them. And, uh, and I would like our staff to, to do that, to have that, uh, that sort of a sober second look at that. Uh, you know, the, and, and there have been some other developments. While the, you know, the lands on the other, on, on the east side of Norfinch, for example, uh, had a, uh, a very dense residential zoning for years. Uh, Metrolinx uh, and, and the TTC and then Metrolinx expropriated their, those lands to build a uh, you know, um, a maintenance and storage facility for the for the LRT. I would think that 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 maintenance and storage facility will be there for the next 30, 40, 50, 60 years, uh, very uh, very actively so. Uh, and uh, and and you know, we and we need to look at it uh, and look at those lands and those uses uh, through that lens. It's a, it's it's an employment lens. Uh, uh, of sorts, and and I think that that's uh, uh, that's very important. So, uh, so with those two things in mind, uh, um, uh, Mr. Chair, I move the motion uh, to basically ask our staff to do that to take two three months uh, and go out and and uh, and reengage the community and and uh, and to and to refocus on the plan. This is, by the way, this is a very very good plan. It's a very very good study. There's different elements to it. You, you 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 wanted it to go there this morning, right? Uh, so so we are where we are. Anyway, it, it's here. I'll, I'll stop there for now. Uh, but I know that we will pick it up uh, in the very near future, and uh, we'll continue this uh, this discussion because this is very very important, uh, a very important plan for a very important uh, part of the city, and we have an opportunity here, uh, you know, to correct a few wrongs historically. And I'm and I'm hoping that we take those. Uh, those opportunities to do that. Um, thank you. And, and, and I thank you for, I don't see a clock, and I thank you for that. I'm, I'm looking to see how much, how much time I have left, and I don't see that, so I'll, I'll stop it there. Thank you, Councillor Perutza. On Councillor Perutza's motion, all those in favor? Any opposed? That item is carried. No, thank you. All right, uh, on to item number, uh, actually, pardon me. Uh, we're just going to uh, go back to an item that we held because I think we can clear that off quick, quickly. That is EY 11.9, uh, Morgan Avenue and Penhurst Avenue parking amendments. Councillor Morley. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you, removing staff recommendations in response to our local school reached out um, requesting this work uh, take place. Um, so I'd like to move staff recommendations. Councilor Morley moves staff recommendations. All those in favor? Any opposed? That carries. And one other item, uh, EY 11.13, or what will be that, is a letter from Councilor Morley. Speed reduction on Burnhamthorpe Road between Kipling Avenue and Dundas Street West. May I have a motion to introduce the item? Councilor Morley moves to introduce the item. All those in favor? Any opposed? That carries. We'll come back to that uh, towards the end of the list. Okay. On to item EY 11.2564 to 580 Evans Avenue Zoning Bylaw Amendment and Draft Plan of Subdivision Applications Decision Report. Um, we have two speakers. The first speaker is Teresa Darby. Is Teresa here or online? Teresa Darby. Okay. Uh, our next speaker is David Mackay, MHBC Planning. Good morning, David. Welcome back to the Etobicoke York Community Council. Uh, you have five minutes. Please begin as soon as you're ready. Thank you. Uh, good morning, council members. Um, we're here after a very uh, long process to develop these lands for a mixture of housing units, uh, including affordable housing units for seniors to be developed by Trillium Health, and they're here if you have any questions for them. Um, we've worked diligently with staff to address a number of the various issues throughout the process, including um, design matters, traffic, parking, uh, air quality matters, because we are next to the highway system, uh, and we'll we will continue to work through those matters with staff through the future site plan processes to implement the recommendations that have been developed with staff and the consulting team uh, to date. Um, I think this is an exciting project that will deliver both much needed housing, as we all know, as well as affordable housing for seniors uh, to be developed uh, in partnership with Trillium. Uh, my client is donating land to Trillium uh, for that development. And also the introduction of uh, a new park that fronts on to Evans and the new street system. So this will be uh, a complete community uh, that will support uh, the existing uh, neighborhood. And uh, we believe that uh, it represents good planning and would welcome the approval t today and uh, happy to answer any questions that council may have. Thank you. Thank you, David. Are there any questions of the speaker? Seeing none, thank you for joining us. Thank you, sir. That concludes the list of speakers. Uh, we will now uh, see if there are questions of staff. Any questions of staff? Seeing none, members wishing to speak. Councillor Morley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you, I wanted to thank staff um, for their work on this file um, and thank the applicant for their patience with this file. Um, it was one that sort of got caught up a little bit in the process and was sitting uh, collecting some dust, but we do, uh, I do believe it's going to represent a real net benefit to the neighborhood, um, including, of course, the donation of lands for seniors' specific housing, which we know is desperately needed in our city. Um, so very excited uh, about the great work that's gone into this and uh, moving it forward here today. Day. Um, I would like to move staff recommendations and look to colleagues for support. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Deputy Mayor Morley. Uh, Deputy Mayor Morley moves this. I'm sorry, I'll just check. Anyone else? Nope. All right. Deputy Mayor Morley moves the staff recommendations. All those in favor? Any opposed? That item carries. Thank you very much. Uh, EY. 11.331 Central Street, application to remove a private tree. We have a speaker, uh, that is Andrew Vanderwall. Is Andrew in the chamber or online? Okay, Andrew's online. Good morning, Andrew, it's Stephen Holliday, Chair of the Etobicoke York Community Council. Uh, can you hear me okay? Good morning, everyone. Uh, good morning, Council Chair and Council Members. I hope everybody can hear me. Yes, very well. Um, welcome, and uh, you have five minutes to speak to the Community Council. Please begin as soon as you're ready. Thank you very much. I'm joined uh, this morning by my wife, Jan uh, Vanderwall. I'm Andrew Vanderwall, and thank you for uh, this opportunity to speak this morning uh, to address the issue of um, the walnut tree at 31 Central Street. 
Uh, by way of introduction, we have owned this house since 1991 when it was our starter home. Uh, we have retained it when we moved some 20 years ago. And since then, we have rented it out to young families. And last fall, our latest tenants became our son and his partner who moved back to Toronto from Kingston where they were studying. And they are both now starting their careers here in Toronto nearby, which we are very happy to support. Uh, there is just this one problem, and that is our son is highly allergic to walnuts and um, allergic to the point of being life threatening. Um, on one occasion, he was rushed to the emergency department, um, all the while spitting into a cup due to a severe throat constriction that came from eating a granola bar containing walnuts. Um, his throat was so constricted, he could not swallow uh, his saliva and any further constriction and he would not have been able to breathe. Now, the walnut tree that overhangs the back deck of 31 Central Street, um, uh, that walnut tree is, is very uh, prolific. It's a, it's a healthy tree, we acknowledge that. And the squirrels uh, just love those walnuts. They chew up the walnuts and bits of walnut pulp uh, rains daily onto the deck, the railings, the table, and generally over the whole yard. These bits of walnut pulp fall into food, get ground into powder underfoot, it becomes airborne, and anything that you touch can have walnut residue. Uh, this renders the backyard of 31 Central Street uh, for our son to be a life-threatening no-go hazard zone, which essentially makes the place rather unlivable. And um, now to put a bit more context into this, um, we um, do love treats. We have planted many on our current property at 41 Superior Avenue, and we've also requested uh, that the city plant trees in front of our property. And we are great supporters of tree bylaws up north that restrict people's ability to remove trees. And our son, um, who has the walnut allergy, uh, remarkably was a tree planter out west last summer where he worked for a company planting thousands of trees. Now, we did not plant this walnut tree. Uh, it, that was done, uh, presumably, by a squirrel some 20 years ago. And liking trees as we do, we just let it grow, not knowing what it was. Now it has become a problem. We will gladly plant a replacement tree uh, or contribute to um, uh, replacement trees. And we actually have a perfect spot for uh, one such tree towards the back of 31 Central Street where previously there was a great ash tree that regrettably succumbed to the emerald boar beetle many years ago. So there's a wonderful uh, spot there for a great canopy tree. And uh, what we have in mind could be something like a, a, a London plane tree or a sycamore that grows to splendid heights. So our request to you quite simply is uh, to give us the okay to do just that, to replace this life-threatening walnut tree with a much more suitable tree that uh, uh, and or contribute as as well to tree planting uh, so that uh, uh, so that we can make the uh, uh, the, uh, the 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 home uh, more livable for our son who currently um, has a great problem with uh, with the walnuts which are not uh, constrained within the uh, within the shell the squirrels do an, uh, an excellent job of spreading walnut pulp just about everywhere over the deck and backyard. So thank you for uh, your attention to this this morning. Thank you. Um, if you just hang on, are there any questions of the deputy? Councillor Morley. Good morning. Thank you so much for uh, the submission here today and, and for your deputation. Um, I just wanted to dig in a little bit more because, as you know, we are big supporters uh, in a typical lecture of our tree canopy and the loss of any trees, especially healthy trees, uh, is a big deal. Uh, certainly the health of your son and the safety of himself and the family are, of course, um, you know, uh, heavily weighted as part of this decision. Um, and I just wanted to confirm that you are fully confident um, because we do have information here from Toronto Public Health that sort of speaks to the shell being contained it's it not um, being considered as a um, life-threatening concern in this in an instance like the one that's where that's before us today um, so can you has there been any exposures or sort of concerns of that nature I know you mentioned the squirrels 
grinding up the walnuts and sort of the the um, pulp or you know um, pieces of them that can become airborne and things like that. Um, so has there been any sort of uh, examples of a situation where there's been concern specific for this on the property with this tree? I, I would point out that uh, the uh, walnut uh, in, is not being contained by the shell. The, 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 the many squirrels do a very good job of, of opening these shells and spreading the walnut uh, uh, interior uh, everywhere. So, so this notion that it is uh, contained within the shell and therefore not uh, hazardous is, 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 is erroneous in this case because of all these squirrels. Mm -hmm. And uh, also, our son um, moved into the uh, residence um, um, only at the beginning of this fall, so okay. uh, last fall, sorry, of 2023. So uh, immediately upon him moving in, uh, we, we recognized the magnitude of the problem. Uh, so it's uh, it's it's uh, we're it's in anticipation of the of the season to come right. that we are trying to address this issue. And and my my wife Jan, I believe, has a yeah. further comment. Uh, Councillor Morley, we did submit um, with the application photographs of um, the the issue. The 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 walnut inside the hard casing is opened up and it is the the squirrels are interested in the flesh the actual nut the walnut mm. so that's what spread all over the place and you know even to the front and all over the place they're not just maintained contained in the backyard so there are pictures to show what the issue is mm -hmm. i don't know if you can access them i there. do have them here before me yes thank you so much jan yeah. Um, I appreciate that, and it is a beautiful tree. I appreciate your willingness to replace it uh, with another significant tree. Um, so those are my questions. Thank you so much. The, the other thing I would like mm -hmm. to add is yeah. that uh, on, on a number of occasions, I have come across people on the street that I've had to call 911 for, and the, re the, the response time, as we know, is very, very slow. Yeah. So with regard to you know, this type of very serious allergy, uh, this is very concerning for us. Absolutely. Well taken. Thank you so much. Thank you. Are there any other questions of the speakers? Seeing none. Um, thank you for joining us today. There are no other speakers, just confirming. Um, and we will ask if there's questions of staff. No questions of staff. Not uh, members wishing to speak? Deputy Mayor Morley. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you, um, I am going to be moving approval of the request to uh, have this particular tree removed for um, the reasons stated by the applicants and homeowners. Um, I do think while we are incredibly um, mindful and protective of our tree canopy and wanting to see that continue to grow in a healthy way in our city, um, the life, safety, and security of our residents is also paramount. Um, so, um, you know, really appreciate appreciate the applicants for their submission today and certainly wanting to get ahead of this before uh, a crisis or a disaster happens for the resident there, so um, potentially. Um, so the motion is before you. I'd look to you for support and thank you to the clerks for their, their help on that. Thank you very much. Anyone else wishing to speak? Uh, I may I just have the motion on the screen and we'll take a look at it. All right. Um, all those in favor of the motion? Any opposed? That item carries. Thank you. Okay, our next item is EY 11.447 West Point Lane, application to remove a private tree. Uh, we have a number of speakers. Our first speaker is Patrick Hansen. And the note says that, ah, is that Patrick? <laughs> You're not on video conference. <laughs> Welcome to the Etobicoke York Community Good morning, Council. all. Good morning. This is my very first time here. You've got five minutes. Uh, yes, please. please. Grin as soon as you're so ready. So my name is Patrick Hansen. I'm a homeowner and also the president of my condo corporation. So, uh, and I have uh, the manager here for the uh, corporation and fellow uh, homeowner. Now, I got a letter and photographs from the owner of the tree. She's also in agreement and requesting that uh, to have the tree removed. Uh, now, this is a, report, a letter from her, 
code right. And these are so I'll explain. Yes, so, uh, sorry, basically, we, uh, this tree is in my neighbor's backyard. It's creating a lot of problem for us. It has uh, raised the, ro the, uh, the fence in. It, uh, the roots have gotten so big that it start to get close to the gas lines or underneath the gas lines, and it creates a lot of flooding, backyard flooding. Also, in the summertime, the leaves, uh, the tree gives off a, a lot of sap that damage our uh, backyard furniture or, and uh, fixtures. And also my fellow neighbor, her kids are, has great amount of allergy to all these saps. And it's very difficult, sometimes impossible for them to go outside during the summertime. And uh, just to let you know, the tree is uh, owned by the Condo Corporation. So on your screen right now, uh, the neighbor who's uh, Backyard the tree is uh, located, constantly have water damage, flooded in her backyard. So that's a photograph of the water that's outside when it rains heavily because the roots prevent the, the water from saturating. If you may understand what I mean. I'm going to show you another photograph here. So all of that, when it rains heavily, she along with another homeowner, have to be outside constantly pushing away water and everything like that. So to prevent the water from coming in their basement. So we also have an engineer report to have a, a drainage run alongside the fencing. And this tree is going to be, is actually in the way and the path of the proposed uh, construction of the drainage. So therefore, we are here seeking your permission to remove this tree. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions of the speaker? Saying none, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is uh, Akanga Okoto. Good morning. Bonjour. Good morning. Welcome to the Etobicoke York Community Council. Uh, you have five minutes to speak to us. Please begin when you're ready. Thank you. I'm French speaker, but I'm I'm gonna try to speak English. I'm uh, one of the owner, and I'm also a member of MTTC 1211. I'm here to complain about the trees because I'm also mother of a three. I have an 18 year old. 15 and 13 and the trees is affecting us a lot to be like a two years i have to keep my big kids in the house especially during summer they cannot enjoy the backyard because of the sap who's coming from the tree and they are very allergic especially my oldest one the 18 year old he was a premature baby so he's very very allergic to it and also with the poo uh, from the raccoon, and even the doctor said the poo affect the lung, the, 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 the poo of a raccoon. So I have to keep them inside. I don't know if you can understand, like having, is not the babies, but the three big kids, which is I have to keep them inside the house. It's very difficult. So that was my concern. Thank you very much. I don't know if you have any questions. Thank you. Uh, yes, just, a question. Yeah, just a question. Elsewhere? So you're on the you're with the condo board, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And and the tree is 
where the apartment is, where the condo is. It's in the backyard, yes. In the backyard. Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Can, yes. can I, may I ask? Yes. Just for my clarity, just so I, because I'm looking at, a, at the computer, I'm looking at an aerial photo. So the condos are like townhouses? Yes, a condo townhouse. Right. Yes. And it's then, semi-detached. And it's two blocks, and in the middle between them are the backyards with fences. And so this tree is right in the center. Yes. And it, it, it's like an umbrella over your yard. It's like an umbrella. And okay. been there for two years, like it, more than two years. How big is the tree? Does it touch the buildings on either side? It does, yeah. Okay. It's hard for me to tell from the picture, that's why. It's a very big. I think two years or a year ago, my neighbor Patrick okay. tried to cut the, the branch from his side, but it's still it growing. It's very tall. I don't know how high it is. So the manager can give you more details on it. It's okay. I just sometimes it's helpful because the pictures tell me a little bit, and then I just want to hear a bit more. So it's very helpful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Merci. Yes, sir. So I just want to be clear: the tree is where? On whose property is this tree? On what? Who owns the tree? Um, Patrick. Sorry. So what's the name of the? Her name is Nadine. Uh, it's on the email. Uh, the level of it's it's okay, Patrick. We can't we can't really vary the procedure. Okay. The, okay. All right. Yeah, Often Nadine, Nadine is in the backyard, and the Patrick is on my left side, and I'm here. So the trees here, this Nadine, Patrick, and I'm here. Okay. So okay. the branch goes all over the like a number layer. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none. Thank you for speaking to thank us. Thank you. Merci. Um, our next speaker is Mary Okoto. Oh, that was Mary. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, the last speaker I have is Miranda John. Welcome, Miranda. So welcome to the Community Council. You have five minutes. Please begin as soon as you're ready. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Miranda John. I'm the property manager for MTCC 1211. Um, when I took over that property in September of 2021, there was a backyard flooding issue. Now the trees in the backyard were planted by the developer. So there are homes on either side and the backyard is in the middle. So trees were planted um, by the developer, small trees and then They've since grown to be huge trees. Some of them are invasive species, and some of them we found out are quite healthy trees. Um, so when I took over that property, there, as I said, there was an issue with flooding, and um, the trees have contributed to some of the flooding. I have a report or a quote from um, an engineering firm who has proposed to do a drainage trench in the middle of the backyards to alleviate the flooding issue. And that particular tree is in the middle of where the trenching is supposed to be. Um, we, we have, last summer we did remove a tree, um, which was an invasive species, but we did pay, the corporation did pay to have another tree planted in lieu. And if you look at the premises, if um, from the computer you have an aerial view, you will see that there are trees all over the premises. Um, we are not asking to remove all the trees, just this one particular tree, um, because it poses an issue. Um, I have a video, as you can see. See how large the tree is? Raccoons jump, go onto the roof causing damage um, to the roof. And um, as Mary and Patrick said, it's almost impossible in the spring, summer to be able to enjoy the backyards. So um, we're asking 
for council's consideration to provide the authority to have us remove the tree. Questions for me? No? Okay. Sure. A time. I just very quickly, how old is the condominium buildings? It's about 20 years. I'm sorry? 20. 20 years. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That's all I had. And the tree is over 30 centimeters right. in diameter. So. Any other questions? No. Nope. Okay. Uh, to. So, so this yes, when the developer. Yeah, the developer planted the tree. The tree, not one, well, the trees on the premises, both in the backyards and in the front of the units. Yeah, it is a huge tree. Thank you. Thank you. Was there anyone else wishing to speak on this item? I think we got everyone. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, questions of staff? So, so the, the, the question I have is, so the argument was made that when it rains, it, 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 the, tree, um, the tree and the tree roots, uh, you know, uh, uh, prohibit the water from, from, from filtering and, 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 and create flooding. Um, I, I, would, I just want to know your opinion. I would think that, that that's kind of counterintuitive. I thought trees drink water. They're like drunken sailors. They love water. Through you, Mr. Chair, that's, I agree with you, with your assessment, Councillor, that uh, the trees, the roots actually helped about the water thing. But whatever we assess at the time of the inspection, that's not the case. Sorry? When we assess the tree in time of inspection, that's not the case, that the roots are blocking something of the tree. It's a great change that needs to be done in that area. Maybe we'll have issues when that was built, but not the tree itself. So you're saying you could prevent the flooding by changing the grade? No, I don't know that. That's the thing. Engineers are proposing some draining and stuff, which is not really a concrete proposal, how close they need to go to that tree, if really the tree is in direct conflict with that proposal. They're just applying to remove the tree, pretty much blaming the tree for every issues they have in the backyard, including raccoons. I don't think the raccoons will go out because of the tree, but still will help maybe so. And, and, and the tree, is it um, like, the, like I've seen a picture of this tree and it kind of like, really it kind of like blocks the view. It's right in people's windows, right? It's grown very tall, very big, right? Like really quickly. Is it normal for this type of tree to grow so fast? It is. It is a linden tree that grows very fast and it's a healthy tree. Yes, that's true. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you, Mr. Dita. Any other questions? No? Uh, okay, members wishing to speak, Councillor Nunziata. Yes, I do have a motion, the alternate. Put it on the screen. There it is. To approve the request. And I did speak to, to the residents and they're in full support of the, the recommendation. Um, so as it was mentioned, this whole subdivision was built um, I think a little over 20 years, that used to be a big site. I remember when I was first elected on council in the 80s, it was one of the biggest fires that we had in the city of York. I was there with a fire with a fire <laughs> department putting out the fire. And uh, so a whole new subdivision was built in that. I forget what the business was though. I know it was a huge industrial building and there was one a huge fire. And at that site, no, it's okay, you can't, you can't speak. Uh, at that site then um, it was purchased and a whole subdivision was built there um, and we have uh, affordable housing we have uh, uh, we have rental buildings there townhouses and so and I agree I mean this tree has really grown in the short period um, blocking the windows and um, so you know as they mentioned they hired an engineer to do grading and it's very difficult for them to do that with this tree and um, I, I really appreciate uh, you coming today to uh, make a presentation because it was here at community council last day and we deferred it uh, to give an opportunity for you to come and um, 
uh, just behind West Point is uh, the West Park Hospital, uh, right behind it, and which, as you know, is expanding. We're opening up a new hospital in the next two or three months, and I hope you take that tour. There is a tour that uh, the West Park is offering to the community before the official opening of the hospital. Um, and so I will be moving the alternate uh, recommendation. Okay. Any other members wishing to speak? No. Nope. Uh, Councillor Nunziata moves uh, an alternate recommendation. All those in favor? Any opposed? That item carries. Uh, members, uh, with your indulgence, I'd like to add an item to the agenda. Uh, it's, um, it's a letter from me concerning um, a request for the city solicitor to report to city council and preserve appeal rights. All those, all, I guess I'll place the motion. All those in favor? Any opposed? That's carried and we'll get that letter circulated. Okay, back to the agenda. You just bear with me here as I flip different screens. Okay. Okay, EY 11.5, Kingsway Crescent between Bannon Avenue and Government Road speed humps. Um, that was Councillor Morley's item, so we held that. There is a report from the, uh, from the Director of Traffic Management Transportation Services. Any questions of staff? Any members wishing to speak? Councillor uh, Deputy Mayor Morley, number five, 11.5. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, moving staff recommendations on this item with my thanks for the good work here um, in response to community concerns. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, I know I didn't support it the last time around, so I'll just ask for a recorded vote, that's all. Anyone else wishing to speak? Okay, uh, recorded vote on the item. All those in favor? Councillor Crisanti, Councillor Morley, Councillor Nunziata, Councillor Peruzza, all those opposed? Councillor Holliday. That item carries. Okay, EY 11.13, uh, speed reduction on Burnhamthorpe Road between Kipling Avenue and Dundas Street West. This is a letter from uh, Councillor Morley. Um, any questions of staff? Oh, we, oh I'm, I apologize, we do, we have a speaker. Um, that would be Adam Rogers, I'm assuming Adam's online. Great. Good morning, Adam. It's Stephen Holliday, Chair of the Etobicoke York Community Council. Can you hear me okay? I can, yes. Uh, can you hear Adam, me? yes, welcome. Uh, we can hear you. Uh, you may begin as soon as you're ready. You have five minutes. Uh, no, no problem. Okay, I'll keep this nice and short. Uh, this is actually uh, the second time this item came up. I just happened to notice it. I was watching the YouTube link this morning. Uh, and I was in support of it last time, so I just wanted to speak my support of it this time. Uh, that particular stretch uh, has a very long, winding uh, stretch of Burnham Thorpe where uh, near, the, near the golf course in the creek. It's an area that often has accidents. I think, uh, I think anyone in that area, I grew up in this area, that area, I know it very well, will be well aware that it already has uh, suggested speed in that uh, around that area. I think this is long overdue that the staff look into this stretch as a way. To, and, and again, I appreciate that uh, the staff is gonna investigate first. I think that's a good way to, it's, uh, you know, uh, any, any, any concer concerns about this area will come up when the staff look into it. But in, in short, that one stretch is already very, um, I don't want to say dangerous, but it's, it's well known to have accidents uh, around that area. Uh, I should also note that there will be a, a development coming in uh, on that stretch very, very soon. So there's probably going to be speed reductions because of the uh, the uh, townhouse development that is coming on uh, just, uh, I should say, just before that you hit Dundas. And then once it once that Burnham Thorpe becomes Cordova, there's also a speed reduction that I'm, I'm I believe because uh, of the school zone. So really, uh, I think this is a good idea to take a look at this area. Uh, it's long overdue, uh, and I think it, it's going to happen anyway. We're going to have a speed reduction here, so it, it's better that the staff get ahead of it uh, before uh, that. And I should also note that, sadly, not too far from that intersection, we had a an incident where a, chi where a child was hit by a car. Uh, it was just at Burnham Thorpe Kipling, so I think it's, it's a good time for the staff to look into the safety of that area 
Um, anyway, uh, unless there's any questions, I'll stay online for a couple seconds just in case anyone has questions. But I'm just I'm fully in support. I grew up in that area. I know it well, and it's long overdue. We at least take a look at it and see what staff says about it. Thank you, Adam. Are there any questions of the speaker? Seeing none, thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Uh, questions of staff? Seeing none, um, to speak, Councillor Morley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you, um, we've been working since taking office on this file, and I want to thank staff, Sean's here today, um, who have really gone to great lengths and, and done really exhausted many of the traffic calming and sort of um, speeding mitigation tools that are available to us. Um, despite these really important changes and the good work that the city has put forward to date, um, this does continue to be a problematic area um, for speeding and for safety. Um, and there are a number of residents that front this section um, who've had, you know, cars c drive onto their lawn and other really problematic um, issues related to the road safety there. So um, we're just asking staff to uh, continue their good work, um, to continue to review what's possible um, to make this stretch of road as safe as it can be. And we look forward to a report coming back um, for further discussion and review. So just moving um, the recommendation that uh, we request the director, traffic management and transportation services to investigate the feasibility of reducing the speed limit to 40 kilometers an hour on Burnham Thorpe Road between Dundas Street West and Kipling Avenue and to report back to us at our April meeting. Um, and that is the motion before you. On the councillor's recommendations, all those in favor, any opposed, that carries. And I believe we have one item left, which was the last one to be added. That is 8 Yorkley Avenue. Um, maybe members, just for your clarity, uh, I'd offer the following brief comments. Um, the, I should ask if there's any questions of staff on that. Okay, uh, I'll speak very briefly. I've got two recommendations. I'm asking the city solicitor to report to the March 20th, 2024 city council meeting uh, about the application and um, uh, asking the city solicitor to, uh, or auth suggesting to council that council authorize the solicitor to preserve council's right of appeal on, uh, at the T-Lab. And just very briefly on it, it has been to the Committee of Adjustment uh, three times, to the T-Lab twice, and to Divisional Court. There's a number of documents attached, um, quite lengthy. And uh, those are there for, for your reading, but hopefully that summary gives a sense of what this motion is. Um, anyone else wishing to speak? No? All those in favor of the motions? Any opposed? That item carries. And we have the bills. Deputy Mayor Morley. I move that bills 177 to 179 prepared for the February 26, 2024 meeting 11 of the Etobicoke York Community Council be declared as bylaws and passed subject to section 226.9 of the City of Toronto Act 2006. All those in favor, any opposed, that item carries. And uh, motion number two, any volunteers? Deputy Mayor Morley. <laughs> um, move that confirmatory bills to confirm the legislative proceedings of the Etobicoke York Community Council acting under delegated authority at meeting 11 on February 26, 2024, be declared as bylaws and passed subject to section 226.9 of the City of Toronto Act 2006. All those in favor, any opposed, that item's carried. And that was the final item. Uh, meeting adjourned. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>